good afternoon and a very warm welcome to everyone in here and out there online. There is, I think, a similar sized audience or larger online. Um, to this year's Nias Lawrence talk. Uh, and a warm welcome to distinguished Nias Lawrence fellow, Evelyn Kroner. Um, and a warm welcome also to discussants Bert Bakker, Maartje Rijmakers and Gijs Schumacher, who will be introduced by Evelyn uh, in a minute, or in a few minutes. <laughs> um, and of course, I have to uh, say a bit of warm welcome to the directors of the Lawrence Center and the Netherlands Institute of Advanced Studies. Uh, my name is Merlijn Olnon. I'm NIAS's Manager of Public Affairs and will be your host and moderator this afternoon. Uh, let me begin by saying a few words about the Distinguished NIAS Lawrence Fellowship Program. Since 2006, the DNLF, as we call it, is awarded annually to a leading researcher to work on in innovative research that bridges <laughs> the humanities and or social sciences with the natural life and or technological sciences. Distinguished Nias Lawrence Fellows are nominated by a heavy committee from within the Dutch Academy. Um, in a few moments, uh, Lawrence Director uh, Roland Merks will take the stage to further introduce uh, the, our latest Distinguished Nias Lawrence Fellow, Evelyn. But before we invite him to do so, let me take a short moment to outline our program this afternoon. In her talk, Eveline will present the findings from the research she conducted at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study over the past semester. After some 15 or 20 minutes, we will open the discussion uh, to the panel and then to you, our audience, as well. At some point, we will invite NIA's director, Jan Willem Duyvendak, on, on stage for a few words, after which we will wrap up. This should be somewhere between a quarter past six and 6.30. Uh, so that we have some time left for informal talk and drinks, to which you are, of course, of course uh, all cordially invited. Um, that's it for me. I'm keeping it short, uh, and I, uh, we want to get on to, to Evelyn and the panel, of course. But first, uh, please uh, say give a warm welcome to the director of the Lawrence Center, Roland. Uh, well, also on behalf of the Lawrence Center, I would like to welcome you uh, to this lecture by Evelyn Krone. And I would also like to express a, a special welcome to all the NIAS fellows who are uh, attending this lecture today. Uh, Evelyn Krone is a professor of de developmental neuroscience based at Leiden University and Erasmus University. And she's well known, of course, for her work on the adolescent human brain. Uh, Evelyn Cohn has received many rewards, including the prestigious Spinoza Award in 2017. And she's speaking today as the recipient of the Distinguished Niels Lawrence Fellowship of 2023. And uh, as indeed was said, uh, this fellowship is part of a really fruitful collaboration between the Netherlands Institute of Advanced Studies and the Lawrence Center, uh, with the aim to promote interdisciplinary research, especially at the interface of the natural and technical sciences and the social sciences and the humanities. And as part of this fellowship, Adrienne Krohn has worked at the NIOS on the development of curiosity in the adolescent brain, where she combined traditional cognitive science approaches with novel methods from industrial design and neuroscience. And also next year, she will organize a one-week workshop at the Lawrence Center in Leiden. Well, I'm sure uh, that your curiosity, at least also mine, for the lecture is developing rapidly. So I will keep it short and leave the floor uh, to the distinguished Nias Lawrence Fellow of 2023, Evelyn Kroner. Great, well, wonderful to be here. Let me see if this works. Um, yeah, so what a pleasure to uh, be here uh, today um, um, with, um, well, many curious people uh, in the audience uh, and um, um, scientific friends uh, who are here also today uh, to uh, discuss the topic of uh, curiosity uh, together. Um, I'm super honored to um, yeah, be able to uh, do this type of uh, research, uh, to have spent six, five months at the uh, NIAS um, uh, Center and also to do the workshop uh, next year. We're already planning it, so um, for me this is not an end point, but an uh, in-between point, uh, not only uh, in uh, kind of the activities, but also in my thinking about the topic. So. Um, 
a little bit of introduction of uh, who I am for those of you uh, who do not know me. So uh, my name is Evelyn Krona. I'm an, uh, a full-time professor at uh, Erasmus University uh, and only slightly, partly still at uh, Leiden University to uh, kind of continue our, uh, our wonderful uh, collaborations. I moved to Erasmus University approximately uh, four years ago uh, to kind of renew the way I was doing my research. I will tell you a little bit about that in a second. Um, at uh, Erasmus University, I started a new lab. It's referred to as the um, Society Youth and Neuroscience Connected Lab. So the idea is to uh, combine insights from kind of high, st of, or of, yeah, high stake, uh, large societal problems uh, with um, the uh, knowledge we have on the developing youth, uh, the knowledge we have on the developing brain, and to connect that and then, uh, well, hopefully that will lead uh, to some uh, magic. Um, and uh, the goal of this research is to do transdisciplinary science. So maybe for those of you who are not so familiar with it, the idea behind it is that we've already known for a long time that working uh, on interdisciplinary science can really move the frontiers of science. So the idea is to combine insights, for example, from sociology, psychology, and neuroscience uh, can help us to get novel perspectives on existing problems. Um, but what I discovered in uh, well, in my journey as a scientist, uh, is that uh, sometimes that's still uh, too limited. So, for example, if you work on questions like how can young people develop optimally in a complex society, uh, well, they are the experts of their own lives. Uh, youth workers work with young people every day. Uh, teachers have a lot of knowledge on, uh, well, the lives of uh, young people. Uh, so the idea that all the knowledge is within the university is, in my view, too limited. We do have a lot of knowledge in the university, but there's lots and lots of knowledge in the outside world. So the idea of this transdisciplinary science uh, is really to combine interdisciplinary science with knowledge from, well, real-world problems, uh, and also to uh, have these uh, stakeholders involved in our research from the ground up. Uh, so not at the end where we give a lecture, this is what we find and what do you think. No, from the starting phase of the research, make sure you have the stakeholders together with you to work on these problems. Uh, and this is where the idea from the um, kind of design research comes from. Uh, people who are familiar with the research, for example, at the TU Delft, uh, at the TU Delft, they will never follow an empirical cycle where you have a question, you do your research, and at the end you have some output, and then you present that to people. No, 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 no. From the start on, they have the stakeholders involved to really define the problem based on, well, the, the technical problem, for example, that they want to solve. Uh, and in this journey that I was following as a scientist, I was wondering, why don't we do the same thing when we talk about um, complex problems that involve uh, the lives of young people? So this was the reason for me to move to a new university, get inspired at a new level, uh, develop new ways of curiosity, uh, and uh, to really work on these types of problems in an uh, urban society that has a high level of complexity. So uh, I know we are in Amsterdam. I lived here for a long time, so I know the 010 to 010 uh, rivalry that we have uh, sometimes. Uh, but uh, Rotterdam is uh, really a uh, super interesting city. It has a lot of resilience. Uh, historically, it has a lot of resilience uh, for many reasons that we, of course, all are familiar with. Uh, it has completely rebuilt. There's a lot of resilience, uh, well, also in the people uh, in the city. It has a big youth community, 200 nationalities. Uh, we celebrate diversity uh, in the city of uh, Rotterdam. Uh, it's part of the research also from the ground up. Um, so uh, it gives a lot of opportunities to uh, examine these uh, types of questions. And if you're wondering, I live in Leiden, so I feel that I'm completely neutral in the uh, <laughs> 020, 010 debate. I'm in the middle, uh, uh, but uh, it's a nice opportunity to uh, also combine the different worlds. Okay, so back to the topic of curiosity. Um, this was something that uh, I actually got inspired by the panel member uh, that we have also today, Maartje Rijmakers. I will introduce her uh, later to you. Uh, but she was doing research on curiosity initially together with NEMO, a science museum. Uh, but every time she talked about it, I was like, whoa, this is just mind-blowing. Uh, I have to think about this more deeply uh, and also understand better how this has a role in the lives of young people that I study in my research, which is people between approximately ages 10 and 25, uh, which we refer to as adolescence, which we refer to as the transition phase between childhood and adulthood. 
Um, so the transition between being reliant on your parents towards becoming an adult member of uh, society. Uh, and, I was, and I kept thinking about these ideas that she was giving me, and I was thinking, how does this play a role uh, in the lives of young people? Uh, and then afterwards, uh, I also got to know uh, two other panel members here today, uh, Gijs and Bert, uh, who uh, study uh, also these types of complexities. And um, well, later on you will see how uh, it all got together in my mind. Uh, I don't know if it totally makes sense, uh, if you can totally follow me, but I think uh, Together, we uh, can really work on innovative directions. But curiously, first, before I start talking about the topic, I thought maybe it would be nice to hear a little bit of your views uh, on how you think about this. So uh, maybe you can raise your hand if you would define yourself as a curious person. Okay, so can you also raise your hand if you do not think of yourself as a curious person? Okay, so we have some people here who will never raise their hand <laughs> for any question. Okay, that's also good to know. Um, Maybe I can ask some feedback on what people think is the definition of curious. What, what does curiosity mean to you? Well, that could be uh, lots of things. Um, you want to know more, and you want to know why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. yeah. that's a very nice definition. Uh, okay, my name is uh, Peter. Um, finding out new things, so new experiences, yes. uh, and understanding how things work. Yeah. That's, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 My name is Lozi. Uh, in my, I think that curiosity is doing, uh, going beyond frontiers of knowledge. She's looking at me like, don't come to me, don't come to me. <laughs> um, maybe on this side? I think it may, I'm Jebo, uh, it may be the ambition mm. to resolve a problem. Ambition, yeah, nice, very nice. I see it, you're, yeah, that's right. Um, being enthusiastic about um, something new, like learning or hearing about something new. This was my missing link, so thank you for that. Um, we'll, we'll hear from you later. Uh, okay, so we heard about uh, seeking new knowledge, uh, finding out things about the world, uh, and uh, the final uh, contribution was also being enthusiastic uh, about um, uh, new things. So um, I looked up the definitions in the literature, and the definitions are things like a strong desire to know or learn something, uh, an urge that you feel to know or learn something, a positive feeling that supports motivation and knowledge seeking during the learning uh, process, um, and then also a little bit older definition, the impulse towards better cognition. So what's for me the kind of the overarching uh, um, kind of thing in all these def different definitions uh, is uh, the affect, the emotion, the, the passion to, to learn new things. Uh, the desire, something that you cannot stop, uh, that, that, that's just in there and that wants you to seek more and more and more information. So um, for my panel, this is going to be my first question, um, whether um, this kind of affective component uh, is yes, underlying most of the forms of uh, curiosity. So some of the common views, if you just uh, Google what does curiosity uh, mean, and so instead of going into the literature, a lot of things that I saw coming up were Things like, oh, children are curious about everything. So this is kind of a common idea that we have about children, that they're always more curious. Um, also, curiosity is good for brain health. I don't really know what it means, but this is something that also uh, came up uh, many times. So uh, it was interesting to see that also if you look at kind of like the common perspectives uh, that um, yeah, people have ideas about uh, curiosity. So... Um, then the next step was to dive into the literature more and find out if there's some truth in that idea that children, for example, are curious about everything uh, and whether this is something specific for children or if we can also still be curious uh, throughout our lifetime. 
So um, um, I kind of went into this literature that suggests that there are a couple of things that are necessary for childhood uh, curiosity. One is a capacity for learning uh, new environments, uh, a motivation, again, the motivation to do so, uh, active exploration, so uh, searching for new things without actually knowing yet why you are going that direction. Uh, and then also, this is a bit specific for this field, but kind of an explore-exploit trade-off. So seeking new information up to some point after which it's kind of, um, um, yeah, saturizes. So th and then you can move to the next phase where you go from divergence to convergence. But then there was another uh, line of uh, research, and this was something that I was really looking for, um, that suggests that maybe uh, it can be the case that uh, younger children show more of this exploration and play, but that there's actually a qualitative shift in types of curiosity in the teenage years, uh, where there's possibly less interest in more of the physical hypothesis or how things work, and more interest in social hypothesis. Uh, I don't know yet if this is really true. It's a direction that people are studying. It's relatively uh, new research in very high impact uh, uh, journals, um, but um, it kind of, kind of resonated with me that if we want to understand curiosity during the teenage years, maybe we have to look for in novel directions. Okay, so I want to kind of go into two chapters in my talk. The first concerns how we, what we can learn from brain systems uh, that support curiosity, and the second is what we can learn from a broader perspective, possibly involving more uh, kind of societal perspective to understand curiosity. So let me first go into the brain systems. Um, okay, studying the brain is one of the most beautiful experiences uh, in my life. Uh, the brain is, is such a unique organ. Uh, we all have it in our heads, and still it's the most unique thing uh, that, um, that can exist. It has a complexity that's comparable, in my view, to the universe. Uh, it is uh, yeah, super complex to understand, and at the same time so close to all of us. So if we look at the development of the brain, uh, it follows an interesting pattern uh, that's only discovered about 25 years ago. So uh, initially, we thought that the brain developed until you were about nine or 10 years of age, because after that time, there's not really a change anymore in the size of the brain. That's what people thought. And every type of behavior that you would observe after the age of 10 would be due to hormones or other kind of things. Um, but it turns out that this hypothesis uh, was not true. So if we look at the brain in terms of its structure and we're looking at the number of gray matter cells, then we see that from the age of zero or uh, even before birth until you're approximately six or seven or eight years old, uh, there's a uh, steep increase in the number of neurons. So those are the kind of the brain cells that do the working power of your brain. And then when you're six or seven or eight years old, you have most brain cells that you will ever have in your whole life. Okay, shall I say that again? When you're about six or seven years old, you will have the most brain cells that you will ever have in your life. Um, okay, but uh, at that point, the brain is still wired in very kind of disorganized ways. Um, and then there's a second uh, pattern, uh, which uh, occurs between the ages of 11 and 25. Now, um, do, uh, you should be aware that the axis differs. It would be pretty dramatic if that was not the case. Um, so uh, the axis is much smaller on the right side. But this change is very consistent. Within every individual, we can see this kind of reduction in gray matter uh, happening during the teenage years. And then after the age of 25, it stabilizes until well, approximately the age of 70 or so. And then there are new changes uh, in how the brain is wired. Um, but this second phase in development is quite interesting because it was not known. Uh, and it turns out that it is a, a huge efficiency gain uh, that happens during the teenage years. And the hypothesis that we're working on is that possibly in those phases in your life where the changes in brain uh, development are the largest are possibly also the, the moments where you're most susceptible to the environment. I have to say this is a working hypothesis in my lab, so the final answer is not there yet. So how does this correlate with creative cognition? So here, and, uh, or with curiosity. So here my thinking was a bit inspired by how we uh, measure and think about creativity. So creativity is not the same thing as curiosity, but it has some commonalities. So the definition of creativity is the generation of a product that's both novel and useful. So it needs to be something that's not 
made up yet before, uh, but it can also not be just anything because then it would be just a wild idea. So it has to be both novel and useful. And uh, creativity is a, a process that involves both cognitive control, so it, it involves effort that you put in there, uh, but also uh, self-generated thoughts. So that means thoughts that are um, related to uh, what well, processes such as mind wandering or mental simulation or autobiographical thoughts. And what we have discovered in neuroscience it is that there's two networks that are um, related to both of these processes. So on the left side, you see the network that's involved in effortful control, uh, and those are processes such as externally driven attention, so a task that you have to perform. And on the right side, you see what we call uh, the default mode network. So this is a network that's active when you are uh, involved in mind wandering. And these are uh, anti-correlated. So if one is active, the other one is not. But there are exceptions. There are exceptions when they are both working together. And this is uh, in the moments of cre creativity uh, or also music performance or processes that kind of, uh, yeah, can be a combination of both of these processes. So this is quite unique because usually they're not active together. Um, and then I thought, well, could it be that in curiosity kind of the same thing happens? So possibly also there it's a combination of self-generated thoughts and effort that you put in there to really uh, seek out a new knowledge. Uh, so this led to the idea that um, well, there's research on, for example, trivia questions, so questions that uh, uh, ask for knowledge uh, on, uh, in the world. Uh, and that type of research has led to the idea that also in uh, children, uh, younger children, older children, and adult, uh, adolescents, there's this combination of activity between two different networks in the brain uh, that when combined together uh, actually leads to new forms of curiosity. So this is a thought that I want to share with you as an audience, uh, how you feel about that idea that uh, possibly this is an uh, important starting point for thinking about uh, the neural mechanisms of, uh, of curiosity. Okay, then I go to my second part, uh, which is um, uh, gonna be a little bit broader than only the brain basis. So the brain basis may be a starting point for thinking how to define curiosity, but now I would like to move to the point where we're wondering, well, when do you need to be curious? What does it uh, involve to be curious in a world that's constantly changing and when you're growing up in a complex uh, society? And what are also the opportunities? Now, I'm now going to take you to a very different line of research uh, to um, help you understand what kind of changes adolescents go through uh, when they think about their place in a complex society. Um, so when, oh yeah, so I have a Macintosh, so the layout is a little bit different uh, on my computer than here, but uh, I think we can work it through. So when you're growing up and you're moving from childhood to adulthood, uh, your social world becomes larger, so from the family to friends to your place in society, uh, and that also involves navigating through different types of goals. So your goals can be personal, can be goals that can be um, broader, can be your social network, or it can be goals that are more uh, societal. So um, if we talk, talk about curiosity, uh, a question that we can ask ourselves is what does it mean to be uh, curious in these different types of context? And do we have to be curious in these different types of context? So if we look at, uh, at the opposite of curiosity, we often refer to that as apathy, so not doing anything, not showing any interest. Um, and curiosity may also help you to develop a desire uh, to understand things that are unfamiliar to you, or perspectives that are uh, unfamiliar to, to you, or thoughts of other people that are unfamiliar to you. So I think you see where I'm going. So and knowing your place in the world uh, may involve knowing your own place relative to your friends and family, but also curiosity towards people who are different from you. Um, and then comes the question, if that is the case, is curiosity also in a way a moral duty? Do we, do we have to be curious to be good citizens? Um, do we have to be curious to make good decisions, for example, political choices or other types of uh, choices? Um, or can curiosity also be a vulnerability? What if you're too curious? Does it also lead to kind of an overwhelming feeling of always needing to understand all the different perspectives? And do you sometimes have to kind of develop more uh, specific um, tunnels in your thinking just to uh, kind of protect yourself from being too overwhelmed. 
Um, so one of the ways that we study this in my lab is using experimental games. And these are games where we ask people to exchange goods, for example, money, uh, between themselves and other people. So uh, this is an example of a sharing task where people can make a choice between A and B. Uh, the top part of the choice is their own gain. So in this case, uh, if you choose A, uh, you get one euro yourself. Uh, if you choose B, you get two euros. Uh, the bottom part is what you give to other people. So if you choose A, you're actually being pro-social because the other person can also benefit. So this would be the pro-social choice where you are willing to sacrifice something of your own goods uh, so that you can share with other people. Uh, other types of kind of th these exchange games are cooperation games where people can co cooperate with another player uh, such as, uh, for example, you can choose between A and B on the left side or, uh, or A and B on the top side. Uh, and if both of the players choose A, uh, that will be the cooperation choice, the collaboration choice. The other choices are uh, more selfish choices. And finally, we also work with giving paradigms where you basically get a certain stake of goods uh, and you can decide yourself how much you want to give to the other person. So I'm showing just this just as examples. It all kind of comes down to the same element. Are you willing to share your sacrifices with uh, Are you willing to share your goods uh, with others? So um, let's take a look at some of the data, uh, what we see happening during the teenage years. So um, this is data from a study where uh, children who were 9, 12, 15, or 18 uh, could share their resources uh, with people in their social network. Uh, and these people in their social networks could be their friends, people they were neutral towards, uh, people that they disliked, uh, or people that were anonymous that they just didn't know. And then at the age of 10, it turns out that um, kids share a little bit more with their friends, but actually they're quite sharing with all the different parties. Uh, at the age of 12, this starts to differentiate. At the age of 15, it differentiates even more. And at the age of 18, people are very willing to share with their friends, but much less willing to share with people that they are neutral about, dislike, or uh, they, uh, are, they just don't know. So within the teenage years, there's something happening in terms of in-group, out-group thinking, where you're more focused on your in-group and less on your out-group. Uh, the same is true for uh, the cooperation game. So this is a game where you can cooperate uh, with different uh, parties. In this case, kids could cooperate with their mother, their father, or someone they did not know. Uh, from the ages of 8 to 14, cooperation generally increases. But then after the age of 15, there comes a differentiation where kids keep uh, cooperating with their mother and their father, uh, but less with someone they don't know. So again, this in-group, out-group differentiation happens during the teenage years. Um, then you think, well, what, what does this say about young people? Uh, are they not willing to share with anyone that they don't know? Well, that's also not the case. So this is an example of a giving paradigm that was done during the COVID-19 pandemic. And adolescents could uh, share uh, 10 coins, uh, out of 10 coins, a certain amount with someone they did not know, an unknown peer, a friend, a medical doctor, a COVID-19 patient, or someone with a poor immune system. And you see different colors, and that's different moments in time. So we followed these individuals over a whole year. The same individuals participated at different times, time points. Uh, about a 1,000 participants were in this study. What you see is that adolescents share about three of their 10 coins with someone they don't know. So they are relatively pro-social. They're willing to share something with people they don't know. Uh, they share about half of their goods with their friend, so kind of an equity preference. But they share actually more with people that they see as in need or deserving. So it's not the case that adolescents just don't share with anyone they don't know, uh, but it depends on who this other person is and how they feel towards this other person. Now, let's put this a little bit in perspective. We talked about young people, a moment in a, a period in their life where uh, they develop new relationship, um, also learn to deal with new technical tools, uh, but also really have an interest in the people around them. We see that these young people grow up in a very complex society with lots of things going on that they care about. They care about social inequalities. They care, care about racism. They care about discrimination. Um, and they care also about the world that they live in in terms of climate change. Um, this is uh, uh, true for a certain proportion of young people that really want to go out there uh, and go out on the street to demonstrate. But in our data, we see that if we ask young people whether they think climate change is really happening, 90% say that they um, 
certainly believe that it's happening and that something needs to be done. So this is very common among young people that they care about these types of problems and it leads to also lots of uncertainty in their lives. So I'm going to wrap this up uh, to um, see if you're willing to join with me in this journey uh, where we can think about possible new perspectives on emerging curiosity. And before I introduce my panel, I'm going to um, uh, ask you and the panel uh, four questions just as a starting point for our discussion. Um, and I'll walk you through the different questions. So the first question is, are there actually sensitive windows uh, or devel sensitive developmental windows, so certain moments in your life uh, where you direct your curiosity towards different goals? Uh, the second question is, is it also possible that curiosity can be overwhelming, such as when, deciding, uh, when uh, dealing with uh, 21st century threats? Because there are quite some problems out there that young people feel uncertain about. So maybe sometimes you want to limit your curiosity to protect yourself. So that's a question that uh, I also have. Um, is curiosity always a positive trait in all situations, or are there also moments where you may um, not want to, um, uh, people to be curious? I, we also have our private lives. We don't want people to be curious about everything that's, that goes on in our minds, so maybe there are also limits to how much you find it normative, uh, valuable that other people are curious. Uh, and finally, is curiosity also a moral duty uh, when it comes to, for example, making uh, political choices? So uh, having said that, uh, I'll introduce uh, my panel to help me with discussing these uh, complex questions. Uh, and um, uh, the panel involves uh, Professor Maatje Rijmakers, uh, Professor Bert Bakker, and Professor Gijs Schumacher. Uh, they are from Amsterdam, uh, and they work on different topics that are all somehow related to these uh, types of questions. So uh, Maatje Rijmakers is a uh, professor in developmental psychology. As she, I already introduced her in the beginning of my talk, she has been an inspiration for me at many different levels in the work that I do. Uh, and the kind of things that she does is uh, studying curiosity across the lifespan uh, from participants uh, from ages six to 100 plus uh, and finding out how uh, curiosity is um, kind of uh, developing in these different phases of life. So we will hear uh, more about that. Um, then I'm uh, going to introduce Professor Bert Bakker and Gijs Schumacher at the same time because they uh, collaborate on the intersection of communication science and political science. Uh, their lab uh, is referred to as the hot politics lab, uh, again from the idea that uh, these are emotional processes and uh, deserve to be called emotional processes. Not everything has to be a rational process uh, and how to value these types of uh, emotions. And as you can see also here, uh, they go from survey research uh, to actually to neuroscience uh, and to uh, societal uh, implications. And uh, I've only known them now since a couple of years, uh, but um, they don't know this, but they have been very inspiring in my thinking. So I am super proud uh, that, uh, that they are here today. So with that, I would like to um, end this um, uh, presentation and ask them to come on the stage and ask Marlijn to walk us through the questions that I started out with. So when looking at these questions you posed, uh, I guess you had the same thing in mind. Uh, and looking at our panelists, I thought, I'm sort of guessing that each of those questions is best suited for one of the pan panelists. So I was wondering, could you pick one and um, you know, discuss uh, the question or uh, possible answers to it from your, uh, your own research and interests? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I guess my expertise is mostly in the last two questions. Do you want to start with these, or maybe you want to start with the first question? No, no, it doesn't, doesn't matter. A, a completely randomized order. Yeah. All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, first of all, it's, it's great to be here, and, uh, and I think I just want to emphasize that the, uh, the appreciation is entirely uh, mutual. Actually, when uh, listening to the talk, I already got a uh, new idea. <laughs> And um, so I'm a political scientist, and I guess the concept that comes closest to curiosity in political science is political interest. But there's indeed a very important distinction uh, between the two, and that is, um, on, on the previous slide, you said something about um, 
wanting to think about something you don't know about. And I think this is a crucial difference with um, political interest. So we, uh, from a normative perspective, so going into one of the last bullet points here, uh, we always say, we often say that it's good if people are politically interested because that means they, 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 they know what kind of vote choice they're, they're making. But in fact, politically interested people are also somewhat problematic. They are the people who report the most emotions, for example, about politics. Uh, they're also the people with the strongest opinions and so also the people to be most difficult to persuade. And so um, part of the politically interested people are actually not curious people because they are not thinking about the other side. They're not taking this seriously, what the other side thinks. They're actually ignoring it. And so I think if you want to... Um, I think we could improve this concept of political interest by actually taking this curiosity aspect into it. And I would be really interested in how that then would correlate again back with our political interest measures. Yeah. Are you contrasting uh, curiosity and conviction in a way? Um, yes. Uh, so the term we would use is dogmatism. And so I would, I would expect very dogmatic people not to be very curious. No. Yeah. You want to respond to that, or should we go on to Martha? Yeah. yeah, no, so, so I get just out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, so is it true that now, basically, um, we separate people into uh, political interest uh, and kind of um, no interest, uh, and there may be a third group that, that we haven't studied so much yet who um, actually... Um, yeah, are uh, still seeking uh, knowledge uh, about, well, uh, I think usually when we talk about people who are voting, uh, we kind of think it's a bit strange that people yeah. keep switching between yeah. parties, but, m but maybe that's a third group that actually deserves more attention, mm -hmm. but I'm saying this without being an expert. No, and, 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 and <laughs> especially, especially in the context of the Netherlands, this is of course the most important group because there's a very large share of the Dutch people who are constantly shifting between parties, uh, typically parties that are alike, though, uh, they don't shift that much between, say, going from the Volt to PVV or so, that doesn't happen a lot. But, um, <laughs> um, yeah, but maybe you want to say something about this, this openness to experience? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, we, we work a lot together, so we have to. Um, a few years ago, we looked at this at a personality trait, openness to experience, and this so this taps, I think, much more directly into curiosity, and so this this openness to experience. The people who, are, who score high on this are people who are indeed curious, but also want to do activities that they haven't done uh, before. And what we find there, uh, looking at Denmark and the United Kingdom, is that people who score very high on this are also more likely to change their vote. And so people who, very, who score very low on this are people who uh, yeah, don't like to read about new things. They don't like to go bungee jumping if they haven't done so before. And uh, they, so they don't like to experience new things. And so these people are, on average, more dogmatic and, and, and sticking to their choices. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Uh, I mean, there's also a benefit to <laughs> sticking to your choices. But, uh, uh, but there's certainly a difference, yes. Um, so when I hear you talking about the, the politics mm -hmm. uh, of curiosity, so to say, <laughs> or curiosity in, po uh, in political engagement, I immediately have to think of the, uh, the slide that you just saw, Evelyn, uh, uh, that was from March's work, where you see the, the ages and the genders, and then you see with males, you see like this really low <laughs> curiosity, and with uh, women, you see, a much larger one around the age of 40, I think, or... I don't think it's yeah. a sample characteristic, right? So yeah, that's but good to clarify. And I'm, I'm asking because, like, really politically uh, active or interested uh, people are often male, I notice. I mean, I notice this as an, as an editor of a magazine with subscribers, and I see what subscribers are reacting to. And you notice a difference between 
male and female subscribers, for instance. So, uh, is, is there anything in this? Or am I reading it? too much into it? <laughs> Might you please debunk some myths here as well for us? Oh, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, the, my research, uh, so the, the graph that you saw is from uh, the sample from Weekend van de Wetenschap. Uh, publieks onderzoek is about curiosity uh, this year. And we are now halfway and we only looked, so we had a press release uh, start of the week, I think. And uh, we only looked at some general trends uh, up to now. Uh, but what we saw indeed there uh, is a uh, high sample of a large sample of uh, 50 plus males and a, a large sample of uh, 50 minus females, uh, indeed. And, uh, but the general trends uh, that we see, yeah, maybe one step back, there are different ways of measuring curiosity and that's quite uh, important, I think, uh, of the, uh, the findings. Um, one definition that I didn't see on your slide was actually tolerance for uncertainty, which relates maybe also to your political thing. And the idea is when um, you experience a gap in your knowledge, you're getting curious. But uh, the size of the gap has an optimum for people. So it's really completely unknown, you don't get curious from it. So you don't want to act on it. Uh, if it's only a very small gap, it's boring, uh, but somewhere there's an optimum. And where this optimum is, which is tolerance for uncertainty, uh, well, would say something about your curiosity uh, trait. So more related also to openness uh, to new experiences. So I think that's a little bit different than the definitions uh, that you gave, and then people most, most research is about uh, questionnaires, except for the very young children, of course. Uh, for example, who were studied by Gopnik because, yeah, they are not uh, going to give you very sensitive uh, responses when you ask them complex questions about themselves. So those are more behavior, about behavior. And uh, we try to combine those in Weekend van de Wetenschap, uh, which you can still join, by the way, if you speak Dutch. Hoenusgierpenjij.nl um, But, yeah, the trends that we uh, see there is that uh, actually for the um, cur curiosity, epistemic curiosity, what we call it, so the hunger for knowledge, uh, in self-reported question, uh, there is an increase uh, with age and not a decrease. Uh, where we do see a decrease in the literature, actually this decrease is between uh, 2040s on the one hand and then 40 to 60 on the other hand. And 60 plus is not less curious. People yeah, mainly interpret it actually differently. Um, but we also look at perceptual curiosity, and um, I'm also doing uh, quite a lot of studies in Nemo Science Museum. We installed a research and development uh, department and a lab on the floor. And uh, what we see there is that young children are running around and, uh, well, trying out uh, all the uh, exhibits uh, there. And uh, that's mostly what we would call perceptual curiosity. So you want to have new experiences. And uh, uh, that goes together with questions like uh, when you see new materials, do you want to touch it? These kind of, yeah, not really knowledge, but new uh, experiences. And uh, also for this we see an increase with age. Maybe a little bit uh, unexpected, but when people self-report it. When we look at the behavioral uh, measures, we actually don't see uh, a lot of age changes. Uh, for the more intellectual uh, curiosity, males report uh, a little bit more curiosity about themselves, but when we look at who is actually looking more informative uh, movies and longer, then females uh, show more behavior. So the story is at least more complex. <laughs> of course, no, no. of course. And this is also true for, for, for political interest. If you look at, um, so one of the things that is associated with interest is knowledge. 
And so, uh, and, but there's of course how much you think you know and how much you actually know. And so men score higher on thinking they know a lot about <laughs> politics, but lower on actual knowledge. So I was after the gendered side of, the, because it's all about age, right? So you must have some insights into this as well, into the gender aspects, because well, you in, in my the research, the, um, uh, the gender differences are always much, much smaller than the age differences. So, uh, the, yeah, going from age 12 to 14 to 16 uh, is big changes in how people think about the world, and the gender differences within it are much smaller um, at an average level. And that's basically because within the genders there's so much variation. So there's so much variation between females and between males. So that's why it's very difficult to say something about the averages. But I did think that you also had some findings about uh, sticking to the gender, uh, to the, uh, the curiosity towards knowledge and curiosity towards experiences. Is that true? Yeah. So. Indeed, so the, um, what we see about self-report is that the women report a little bit more curiosity towards experiences and male more towards knowledge. But uh, exactly what you say, the individual differences are so large that's actually not very informative, uh, especially not on the individual level. So I, I think it's more informative to look are there actually more different types of people and uh, yeah, within a population, then directly relating it to a female and male, for example. Thank you. And looking at the questions, is there one specific one that popped out for you? Well, I think the first one was kind of uh, written towards me, maybe. <laughs> um, but there, so if you also look at the literature about curiosity, there are a lot of subjects uh, where it is about. So you have, uh, for example, also curiosity about your own reasons why you do things, but also curiosity uh, about the reasons for others uh, to do things. So that's more the social uh, uh, curiosity. And I think the subject is very important uh, here. So uh, that's uh, one thing. And the other uh, thing is also the opportunity uh, to be uh, curious. And well, just uh, an observation. We were, for example, also in the museum night in Nemo to um, promote our research, but also to take movies uh, about uh, the curiosity of young people, mostly uh, for experiments that we did there. And if you come in the night to uh, Nemo, the people are as curious, as active, interacting with uh, exhibit as young children are during daytime. So it's really also the context mm -hmm. and the kind of uh, competition mm -hmm. that there is with other groups and expectations that are around. So I find it very difficult to say in a general sense there is a well, sensitive period of, uh, for do, curiosity. But do you think there may be uh, changing norms? Uh, because I know that, well, uh, uh, m many people I know want, uh, also for myself when I had children, uh, it was the wonderful opportunity to play because I would use it as an excuse that I would play with my children, but I just enjoyed it so much myself. So, <laughs> yeah, or going to, um, the Efteling or something like that. So, but now it's again a bit weird because my children are teenagers. So then, uh, but um, so I'm wondering if this also. That's why you want grandchildren. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not that old yet. But um, m maybe uh, if we look at uh, these, maybe there's not so much this developmental windows, but maybe that's what you refer to also the opportunities. Or do you think they're changing norms in our society about what's accepted in terms of curiosity? Yeah, I think norms uh, play a role uh, here as well. Yeah, definitely. Who, who makes up those norms? Well, maybe Beck knows, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, it, was just research, my, but it was actually my question, right? If yeah. my, my wife said this yesterday, if I see my four-year-old, she can be so happy and, and, and explore stuff. And it's like, where did it go at some point, right? But do, do, we, do we at some point in puberty get, is it shame or so, or self-awareness? That makes us, so maybe yeah, that... I find it difficult. I think norms play a, a role uh, there. 
And yeah, if you think about curiosity as uh, also a gap in your knowledge, and uh, when you're young, there's a lot you don't understand. You cannot predict or you predict wrong. So also all those questions, which are sometimes brilliant questions actually, refer very often to like daily experiences that are actually conflicting uh, with the ideas that you have. Because we know, and that's also a part of our research, that um, you start with a lot of misconceptions about the world. It's not that you just don't know it, but you do have some ideas about how things work. For example, about floating or sinking or uh, whatever phenomena you can observe. So you do have ideas. And there we see that if uh, you observe a conflict with these ideas, and actually science museums yeah, anticipate on this, uh, then you get curious, oh, what's happening here? How is that possible? Let's try it again. So this also plays a role, I think, just your knowledge uh, that you have. But Bert, were you also hinting at perhaps uh, situations where curiosity was not stimulated enough? Yeah, that, that, yeah, that could, you know, as a parent, I'd like to, to have an, uh, an ambition <laughs> that, that, that some of what I do helps, right? But. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, but I was also thinking about politics, what you said, Maartje, is, is at some point maybe of the feeling, yeah, now I, I, have, I have enough information, do I still need to be curious about the new things? So that, you know, that, that was suddenly sort of a thought that came up to my mind, it's not what we study. Um, yeah, but I think it's, I would say it's more about your sensitivity to hmm. inconsistencies yeah. uh, that you would observe. How sensitive hmm. are you? for observations that are not really consistent with your own ideas. Um, are you going to act on that or not? I think it touches on the second and maybe also the third question. Yeah, yeah so answer? actually, yeah, so related to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the third question and also what you just said in a, a different set of studies with, with some of my American uh, collaborators, we, um, we were interested in what this role of, of curiosity, well, open-mindedness and um, was, and, and one of the thoughts was, well, people are just more curious, they update information as they get along. So if we give them information about a policy they don't know much about, so we did this in uh, Danish samples and American samples, we did stuff like farm policies, Americans know nothing about it, or federalism, how to organize the country. No, not so much ideas, but then we give them some information and one line of reasoning would be that, well, these more open-minded, curious people just update. But then in, uh, in political science literature, there's also the idea that, that people have strong identities about politics. And especially what we did is in these experiments, we uh, manipulated which party would be supporting a certain policy, so more foreign policies. Uh, and then we say the Democrats or the Republicans, or in De Denmark, a left bloc or right, uh, red bloc would support it. And what we set out to theorize is actually that people sometimes use their capacity to think and to be open-minded to actually align their positions with their political identity. So this is a combination of the two. So instead of that, their curiosity overrules their identity, they actually use their curiosity to align their identity in line with their political preferences. So what we consistently find in a bunch of experiments is that people follow their party in the direction the party goes if they're in favor. They follow it. If it, they're opposed, they follow it. But especially if they are open-minded and curious. So, is it a positive trait? Um, maybe sometimes, but it's a so it's it's not, it's it's again yeah. Well, here you put a bunch of scientists on a stage and they come to tell the world is complex. Um, yes, it is. It is more complex, but it it so it it creates a bit of a dilemma of of open-mindedness and curiosity in the domain of politics, uh, especially in combination with with this identity, and and I've. We haven't really followed up on it. I had all sorts of ideas how to do this better, but at some point, mm -hmm. uh, especially to, f yeah, the, it is also a small group of people, but the alarming fa part of this, this set of studies is this. The people with a strong identity and who are open-minded curious are often also the people who participate in politics and who know how to voice their opinion about politics. And if they are also not the ones who, who are actually behaving as the democratic idea would be, updating, but instead of actually defensive, they might actually also be selecting more extreme politicians. They might actually be voicing these opinions and we create this, this spiral of polarization. So that, that is, so is it a positive trait? Uh, on many aspects, yes, but not always. I 
think it would be great if we open yep. up uh, to the audience. And maybe in the meantime, I can ask you the question that I think many people yeah. will have. Many young people in the last elections voted unexpectedly conservative. Would you see that also as an exploration of a new trend? Or do you think we, well, do you have an exploration? I was just going to ask about your lab because you, you showed the picture of the like, progressively active mm -hmm. activist kids. Uh, so is, do you also see the other side in your... Uh, so in terms of climate change, we, we don't see a lot of climate mm. neglecting young mm. people. So overall, they acknowledge mm. climate change takes place and they worry about it. But I do see in my lab that kids experience a lot of uncertainty mm. currently about the world, which affects them also a bit in their mental health. Uh, it's a bit overwhelming, uh, the, the threats of uh, the current century. I don't, and, and then that might be an explanation of taking a more conservative point of view, but it could also be that they think, oh, cool, <laughs> let me try this party. I don't know, so, yeah. yeah. Shall I move into the audience? Yeah. yeah. I'll just come, uh, come, come up to you with the microphone. So could you introduce yourself and then... Okay. Yes, I'm uh, Han van der Maas. I'm a professor in uh, psychology. And um, I have two fundamental questions, but let's start with the first one. If I have time, we go on to the other. But back to the, to the definition. So you started with also emotions and urges and things like that. But one definition that you also uh, put on the screen was this exploitation, exploration balance. And that's now a very popular idea also in AI. So in AI, they, just, they have these learning machines, and then it's all about this exploration, exploitation balance. And many people now say this curiosity is just that. It's just uh, spending your time on exploitation versus exploration. And then it can also be that machines actually have uh, curiosity, but that doesn't really fit your first definition. That was all about emotions, urges, things like that. So can computers, can machines be curious, uh, yeah. according to you? So, so to me, those are not contradicting uh, each other um, because um, even if you want to explore, there needs to be something that motivates you to explore. So again, also with the knowledge gap, I mean, I, I can see the point where uh, if, if the knowledge uh, is too far away, it's too complex, if it's too far, it's boring, there needs to be an optimum. But still, there needs to be some kind of motivation or desire uh, to uh, reach that optimum. So for me, those are not contradicting, but maybe I'm too naive in that point of view. Yeah, I, these two are together, huh? so I'm uh, already uh, <laughs> six steps behind here. They talk about this in the evening. Uh, but um, what do you think, Martin? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, new perspective here. Um, um, yeah, I, I see there's a, a very fundamental characteristic of our attention system. Actually, so um, we are also doing perceptual research with infants, and uh, there it's really the basic quality of the attention system is you know, when um, infants see something unknown mm -hmm. that they cannot grasp, they orient uh, towards it, stay looking at it until they know it enough, yeah, they're the, getting the, the bored and reorient. There so has to be a desire, they can also just fall asleep. The, the, there has they to be also do, yeah. of course, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. there are, uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, like food and uh, whatever are competing mm -hmm. kind of uh, activities, but it is a kind of fundamental desire mm -hmm. uh, to do so, which is, yeah, probably has an evolutionary background. Mm -hmm. Because curiosity is also an issue in a lot of uh, animals, actually. Yeah. So I think it's, yeah, a kind of fundamental desire for people also. And maybe in some more than others. I think we also have to kind of make a case of for the people who do not want to explore all the time. Uh, and also <laughs> for infants, a lot of yeah. individual differences, which are somewhat predictive of their later uh, development as well. So was your second question related, or shall I just? No, Save it for a little bit, yeah. <laughs> well, I also okay. I also have two questions, and I just stick with the first one. Namely, we have uh, just finished a global, huge uh, societal experiment mm -hmm. in the lockdown period. How did the lack of if impulse from outside 
Im Im impact or, or curiosity. Could you introduce yourself? To yes, uh, I'm Anna Tidish from the Lawrence Center. So I don't know how it affected curiosity. I do know it affected three other basic fundamental needs of young people. So the need to explore and take risks and go out there, and the need to form deep and intimate friendships, uh, and the need to be heard, seen, and respected. So those are three fundamental needs when you're young, uh, and all those three needs were harmed uh, by, um, by the experiences uh, of the pandemic. But the question of how it affected their curiosity, I don't know. It affected, for example, their ability to form new friendships later on. So uh, kids who are now uh, starting university missed a couple of crucial experiences in the late teenage years while they were in high school. And they find it much more difficult to develop new friendships. It's a bit different from curiosity, but it did affect uh, young kids um, in important ways. They'll deal with it. There are other examples in history where um, yeah, it was a difficult time for young people. They'll find their way. But to just say like, oh, well, you can just have the experiences now and then it's gone, uh, that's not the case. But the young people themselves keep s telling us in the focus groups that we have with them, we're not a lost generation. So there's a high need to be also, again, seen, heard, and respected for who they are. Uh, and they don't want to have this kind of stigma. Yeah, if I can. Yeah answer this as well um, and, and one of the uh, common activities during the pandemic was so-called doom scrolling uh, not, not necessarily among adolescents of course and we were guilty of it too but um, uh, so the uh, f uh, my take on this is that 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 something like a pandemic so a major threat uh, people get anxious anxiety leads to people s searching for more information and so this information seeking is, of course, also a feature of curiosity. That's why I'm linking it. Uh, and again, this, this I think, shows the, the pros and cons of this. I mean, it was good that people were informing themselves during the pandemic. But it, of course, depended on the source of information they were engaging with. And some people really went down a very deep rabbit hole of conspiracy theories and never crawled out of it. Other people, you know, they actually got in touch with some very good information. Hopefully they, uh, they keep on doing that. <laughs> okay. Hey, I'm Gustavo. I work with Burton Heiss. Um, and I have a question about, or something to discuss about um, curiosity and open-mindedness, the actual distinction. Uh, because I've been thinking about open-mindedness in politics and I can see how it can lead people to easily accept something more radical, for example. I mean, you may say, you know, maybe we should support the government and so on. I can, I can see why we would do that. Or you can say, let's overrun the government. Why not? And I can also see why that, that, that is possible. And I can also update beliefs based on that. So that might be something to do with open-mindedness. But curiosity, supposedly, would be essential for democratic dialogue and for actually seeing through hierarchies and questioning the system, so to learn more. Um, and my, my point would be, Someone that is open-minded supposedly is more curious, but someone that is very curious isn't necessarily super open-minded. Maybe they were very mm -hmm. skeptical, like the ancient Greek type of skeptical, skeptic, like uh, cynicism, where you do not accept any new information as a new belief. You're always questioning everything, but you'd still look for more information. And these sorts of people would, in a way, keep the democracy more transparent and democratic and always question power structures. Mm -hmm. So it's... Uh, do you think that this distinction is really important mm -hmm. or? Do you want to hear your advice or say something about this, Gustavo? <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do. I think it's a great point. I'd love to learn about no, it. Good question. You point. should do a dissertation about this. <laughs> no, yeah. no, I'll tell you something about a project that you might not be familiar with. Uh, <laughs> but we, uh, we uh, with Christoph van Eck, we, as a communication scientist in my department, we we, we were interested in what happens if you put people together to discuss uh, climate change policies. And so we, we got uh, young people uh, together who differed on opinions. And uh, because one of the ideas would be that if you put people together that differ a lot on opinions, then they, they would just polarize more. Actually, this is uh, 120 something people. Uh, across all these conversations, the, the pattern was pretty si similar. They conversed. They were like, oh, so interesting. I never thought about this and that. Um, so why do I bring this up, Gustavo? Um, 
one way would be to think about individual differences, but sure, these people, we actually didn't measure their individual differences in curiosity here, but they did, were very different in their opinions. Some were very much in favor of certain climate mitigation strategies, others definitely not. But it seemed that just putting them together actually stimulated some curiosity and exchange of viewpoints in the domain of politics. So I've just writing up that paper in the last period, I've been thinking that maybe actually for politics in particular, uh, these individual differences might matter somewhat, but it might also be that we just don't teach young people to just discuss politics altogether. So providing an opportunity for them to discuss something is actually really interesting because they rarely do it, yeah. because they keep it for themselves. Uh, it's such an important point, especially also for the teenagers and the young people. Uh, and it makes me also think about providing opportunities. Yeah. So I work a lot with kids in very poor neighborhoods, yeah. neighborhoods in Rotterdam. They don't have the time or the resources to um, yeah, spend time uh, discussing these yeah. ideas. So providing also, so we al often think of schools as the equalizers in yeah. our society. Yeah. That that can be the place where new opportunities um, arise. So yeah, I, I have to think about it more, but I think it's a super important point in terms of providing opportunities for all young people and not a, not a subgroup. That's yeah, fortunate no, I, enough I to I have I've been guilty of that as well, right? Just, just uh, then you start to look for the individual differences. Uh, that's the curious versus the non-curious, but maybe they're actually in certain domains, like, like actually kind of, uh, it was also, I sit in some of these focus groups and people were really uncomfortable in the beginning to just start talking. They're very not used to this. Mm -hmm. And this is maybe also very different in some other cultures where you might be, you, where you get trained, like I'm thinking about the United States, where there's a lot more training early in school to, to, di to discuss and take an opinion. And they were really like a bit shy in the beginning and then they started talking and, and seen another presentation by somebody else who did something similar during the pandemic and she told the story that people reached out to her if they could get the contact details of these people they'd had a conversation with uh, because they wanted to continue the conversation. They kind of enjoyed it. So maybe just actually stimulating, uh, I think indeed schools might be the, the best place to do this. Hi, my name is Jitska. Also, my question is a bit related to that. What other factors can stimulate curiosity? And I was also wondering about the societal context, mm -hmm. in which situations it's more stimulated than others. Hmm. Marcia, <laughs> I'm looking at you because uh, I think um, it, it deserves a little bit of context also in mm -hmm. whether it's always needed everywhere to stimulate curiosity or if hmm. it's in some domains of life more important than others? Yeah, I was still thinking about school context and I think uh, it might be important uh, that the situation is kind of open-ended uh, there so that it's not necessary that you really uh, learn to that and then pass your test for this kind of subject uh, because that makes it more difficult. Uh, to be still curious uh, about, I think. So when you have like control over uh, what is the information and uh, where are you gonna look for the information, uh, I think that's, uh, so your self-control in this might be very uh, important because it's really your, yeah, your own seeking uh, for knowledge and not that you get the knowledge Present. I, I also related. So when I was at the NIAS, there was also a writer uh, working on a book on the art of listening. <laughs> so often I'm thinking with about the United States case where people are so good at debating, mm. so uh, all the time sharing their own views, mm. but the art of listening um, is an art in itself. Huh? Then if you're really curious, then it involves also. Yeah. I'm also thinking about, uh, again, going back to politics. Sorry, that's my, you know. <laughs> my expertise um, is about what the media gives you. Um, so mm, how much are, are we as voters stimulated to be curious about politicians, political parties? If you look at television, there's so much conversation about things that I don't think are, are really all that important for our political choices. They, they talk about opinion polls. They talk about politicians not liking each other or, 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 or liking each other talking about future coalitions, mm -hmm. but they talk much less really about the, the policies that people stand for, uh, the personal motivations. 
Um, I think there could be much more emphasis on that. And what can we do as scientists to help um, the media start this conversation? Or yeah. I always try to think, <laughs> what can I do myself to um, help with making this happen? I, uh, I, I often have nightmares about writing the policy impact sections of, of my work <laughs> because it is super hard for us. But I mean, as a political scientist, I can, I can say something like, oh, this doesn't work or that doesn't work. And, but I mean, there are reasons why the media focuses on opinion polls. And I mean, they themselves are very convinced that this is great television. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard to change this. I've never succeeded at that, so I also can't advise you on it. <laughs> <laughs> Mention the book. You mean it's Miriam Rush, and the book is called uh, "The Art of Listening," written in Dutch. It'll be out this summer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I have one more question in the back. I'm not sure if there's anyone else who has. Yeah, you have the second one, and you had the second one as well, right? <laughs> Shall we do, do those three, and then? Yeah, and can I ask just one more question to you, but also to the audience on this concept of your moral duty to be uh, uh, curious? Mm -hmm. Uh, because, uh, well, you talk about media. I mean, I've spent hours in the last week uh, searching for Kate Middleton and what's going on in her life. <laughs> so, um, I mean, yeah, we have our guilty pleasures uh, where that information is just, to me, you were so snooping. interesting. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, and then I think, oh my goodness, I have a moral duty to be curious about other things in life. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so. I, Maybe some therapy for myself. I'm wondering how people deal with this, or what the views are, uh, or if it's just a fact of life, um, and uh, yeah, we have to work with that. that how about you, Merlin? Yeah, have you I'm searched for Kate Middleton in the last? Uh, <laughs> no, I haven't. Sorry. <laughs> you were on retreat. Hmm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hold on. I have to go to back first. Hi, my name is Georgia, and I'm absolutely not an academic. I'm not as smart as you are, but I'm very much involved in the sexual development of adolescents and young people. And we did a lot of research of the 12 to 18, and then the 18 to 28, also for WHO. And what we saw, especially for the younger adolescents, they really, it's not so much about curiosity, but it's finding a way to get a balance between the, the, the norms and morals of your parents and exploring your own um, identity and your own ideas about life and about, well, about sex. So you don't have to talk about sex, but that's my, <laughs> my thing. And the interesting thing is that actually the, the, the young people of 18 to 28 were much more curious about um, new ideas around how they could have a relationship so I thought maybe you also have to think a little bit of the time that you have to find a balance between being part of a family and becoming an independent person. And that's an extremely difficult uh, balance you have to find in your life. And I wonder how that is relating to your uh, work as well. Right. So in terms of following norms of parents versus peers versus society, uh, we see that transition takes place in exactly the ages that you mentioned. So when you're very young, you follow the norms that your parents set. Then when you become a teenager, you follow the norms that are defined by your peer group. Uh, and then when you're an adult, you usually follow the rules that we just agreed upon together in society. So when you get a speeding ticket, you may not, just, you may not like it, but you pay the ticket because that's just what we agreed upon together. Um, so there is this shift from parents to peers to society. But an interesting thing is, especially talking about the politics, is that there's changes across time in terms of how people vote um, based on what their parents also did, or um, yeah, the verzuiling, I don't know what the English word for it is, uh, where in the current times, I think a lot more individualism is allowed, and so that can also make it more complex for young people to kind of find their own path in terms of their political identity, but I, I know that you often also see that as a kind of an, um, a positive thing, right? That you have the opportunity to make your own deliberate choices rather than having to fo follow the norms set by a certain culture. Or yeah, I guess that, that inherently in, in some of the models of, of how, how we think about what is a, a, a way to arrive at your vote choice, then, then information and, and about current politics is considered a positive thing and not so much the norms 
of your parents. And uh, there's been a little bit of research, the data is scarce, but it's been a little bit of research by other people, Kevin Smith and Peter Tammy in the United States, they have uh, genetically involved, uh, so twin studies. Uh, and they seem to find that the, um, in, in the sort of the political outcomes, that remember, like ideology, vote choice, that um, the influence of parents decreases also as, as, as kids uh, age, so the shared environment uh, uh, component uh, decreases over time. And then the unique environment, so the peers' information increases. So that would align. Yeah. Okay, um, back to Kate. Um, <laughs> I'm already nervous. <laughs> No, no, it's Are you about also interested uh, in Kate Hall? It's about uh, one topic that we don't normally discuss uh, in public as psychologists is the measurement problem. Because uh, yeah, the measurement of curiosity <laughs> is a very, very painful subject. It's very hard to do this in a good way. And it's even sure, unsure when we, we can really do this. And it has to do with this last uh, sentence there, the positive trait. So is it a trait thing or is it a state thing? And yeah, also in what you said a bit earlier already, it, it could even be the case that there is no trait, it's just a state. So uh, we can make a test, uh, a curiosity test uh, about Kate, and then you will be the most curious person here in the room. Or it can be my guilty pleasure, we make a curiosity test about chess, for instance. Uh, but is it possible, is it possible that it's just a state? So it completely always depends on, it's a completely domain-specific topic, and everybody is curious in some topics, but there is nothing trait like in curiosity? I really don't know, so I'm, I'm, that's my question. Yeah, so I, I think we heard a lot of examples that there is at least some trait level, right? Because otherwise there would not be these relationships with openness and the things that are being considered um, a curiosity yeah, aspect. If that in the same domains, then it will be correlated, but mm -hmm. is, is my open-mindedness in chess correlated to my curiosity about Kate, probably not. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know who Kate is, actually. But <laughs> oh, <come on>. <laughs> <laughs> no, really not. <laughs> uh, now you're going a bridge okay. too far. You had me at chess, hey, but uh, <laughs> and now uh, you're making too much of yourself. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, so, yeah, it's a great question. So, uh, is curiosity so domain-specific that it actually uh, is not a trait that you, uh, you can measure? Yeah. My gut feeling would be that, that that's not the case, but I don't have the um, actually I evidence to support. I think there's quite some genetic component in openness to experience, uh, at least, would, uh, which suggests, I think, there is also a trait aspect uh, to it. In some of our recent work, we're trying to uh, answer this question by, by contrasting um, trade-like features in, the general, in, in general with trade-like features in the domain of politics, and uh, exactly to evaluate this type of questions. It's a bit too early to say what the outcome is, but, uh, but, but at least in terms of, of, of emotions, um, there seems to be quite a lot of differences in how people describe them in the general domain and in the political domain. So, um, actually, I invited you on stage. He said no, so he brought it me in the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would be great to hear a little bit about the research that you're doing. Maybe you can just kind of summarize it in two or three sentences. It will be so fun for people to know because it is super, super interesting no. and related to the topic. You don't have a mic. I don't have a mic. Oh, do you want to have mine? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now this this uh, trait, uh, you also, uh, I know a bit more about creativity actually than curiosity, and you said that it's quite similar. And there I really doubt at this point that there is something like uh, domain general creativity. It's so much related to expertise. So whenever we look into someone's expertise, as for instance, now let's say chess or whatever, math or arts, uh, whenever people are say excellent in, in uh, art, then they are b creative by definitions and they will also be curious by definition. But at the same time, if you then, yeah, an artist asks something about something that they don't like, they, are, they might be the most uh, uncreative person uh, you found. So, yeah, it's very hard to, to distinguish expertise. Uh, and, and also in creativity, you know, there's this whole discussion about that there's really a trait like that there are, there are people that are really creative over the whole yeah, line of possibilities. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's undecided. But, uh, okay, so I see um, your point. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, on, I'm unsure about this. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's good to have a critical note. So I can only share my hypothesis. So I think um, the difference between creativity and um, uh, curiosity is again this drive, this desire. So for example, as a scientist, I'm so addicted to my work, I just cannot stop thinking about it. There's always this desire to write this new, read this new paper. My husband thinks it's crazy, we're on vacation, but I just cannot stop it. It's, a, it's an addiction in a way. So that's kind of the component that I'm searching for uh, in this yeah, kind of journey towards understanding curiosity. Uh, to really understand this drive. Um, and there, I think, it may be something that's person-specific. It's an hypothesis. So your okay. next paper is about Kate Middleton? Or? <laughs> <laughs> so there, my curiosity doesn't go far enough. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a different type of curiosity. So there is the case again. OK, we have the last question. Oh. <laughs> oh, I feel really lucky. And uh, actually, it was a very good introduction to my question, because curiosity is, uh, I'm just um, thinking about the definition. Until now, it seems it, is, it seems it is something that you have to a certain extent, like how do you measure it? But in fact, it's not a homogeneous thing in a person. So now you are talking about your own science. But if I gave you articles about I don't know, horses or uh, veterinary medicine or something, other things, maybe you would not be uh, tempted to read it at all, let alone during your vacation. So um, what is that dimension to curiosity? Uh, which, how do you measure it or, or how do you define it? Um, because it's not the same thing for everybody towards everything. And the other aspect of it is the going down the rabbit hole aspect. If, for example, my conviction is that maybe I'm a Trumpist, I only am interested in this line of, of, of news, facts, whatever. So curiosity is not a, an objective thing. And how do you deal with that in your definitions and in your research? Yeah. So uh, we probably won't agree uh, 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 today, uh, but I uh, dare to doubt whether uh, it's so specific, my curiosity in science. I think for any topic, I can develop this. So um, yeah, I think also the reason that I'm studying this is an, uh, it's a combination of serendipity factors, uh, but if the serendipity would have moved in another direction, I think I could be just as curious about studying another topic. Um, if you're rewarded, right? Well, yeah, it's a desire. It's not a reward at the end. Um, but I do think there's a difference between that type of desire for knowledge and the guilty pleasure type of uh, desire for knowledge. So let me make that clear before, uh, in the end, uh, everyone thinks I'm so interested in the royals uh, of the UK. <laughs> I actually thought of mine, but I'm not going to tell it. Oh, uh, I, I'm shameless <laughs> I'll, with these I'll things. tell you later on, <laughs> because, it's, because it's time for uh, Jan Willem to, uh, to come up. To share his guilty pleasures. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. Uh, thanks so much, uh, guys. I actually will be very brief, um, and I assume, assume that you will say thank to everybody. Uh, so this is just uh, some uh, words, but really very brief, um, for Evelyn, uh, who was our distinguished Nias Lawrence Fellow. Um, and this is a very, well, uh, nice, I hope, a sign of distinction that you will get, and flowers. Um, Two uh, very small uh, remarks. The first is, and I wrote this down before you told us about Kate Middleton, um, <laughs> that uh, I was thinking about your special qualities. And um, one of the special qualities is that obviously Evelyn is highly exceptional, right? I mean, there's barely anybody in the scientific world in the Netherlands that received so many uh, awards and signs of distinction. And you're very down to earth. <laughs> Ordinary almost, I would say, right? I mean, the Kate Middleton thing is very much fitting there in. Um, but slightly more serious, I was thinking about that you are at the top of uh, Dutch academia, 
but not behaving at all as somebody who is arrivé, right? So it is an interesting thing to think about the type of, um, what kind of scholar, what kind of intellectual are you? Um, and most of you are young and I'm old, uh, and I'm not sure many of you read Antonio Gramsci. I did when I was young. Uh, he's a political philosopher, as you might know, and he has this very nice notion of an organic intellectual. And I think you are a kind of organic intellectual in three ways. First of all, because you work, as you said yourself, right, with your stakeholders. You work with the young disadvantaged kids in Rotterdam, right? So that is very special, I guess. And uh, second, um, you did it somewhat today. Uh, it showed here on the stage. You really are interested in working with others, other scholars, in a highly a dialogical way. Uh, and you're always thanking your collaborators uh, in a very, uh, much better than many of us do, do. So I really like that. And you were a very important person within the NEOS community. This again shows that you are a kind of organic uh, intellectual. Last remark, um, NEOS, my institute, tried to think about itself as being special and then actually we use the term Yes, because at NIAS we do curiosity-driven research. After today, I don't dare to say that anymore. I'm not sure what we say with it, but also <laughs> it's a little bit yes, self-congratulatory or perhaps strange because it seems to, su to suggest that other people who are not at NIAS are not doing <laughs> curiosity-driven <laughs> research, which is <laughs> kind of embarrassing. Uh, well, we are not going to discuss the state of Dutch academia here. It might be that indeed we are somewhat worried that in Dutch academia, not everybody has the opportunity to pursue curiosity-driven research, right? I mean, we, we have even um, the national science agenda decided by Dutch parliament. So we can discuss to what degrees in which ways we have the liberty to pursue curiosity-driven research. Um, but at NIAS, at least we claim we, we do. Then Evelyn came, and Evelyn wrote down, we asked everybody to evaluate their stay at NIAS, right? And Evelyn was the most <laughs> critical review we ever got. And I'm very bad director, right? I don't like to be criticized, or my institute to be criticized. <laughs> but she wrote down something very interesting related to curiosity. She said, okay, NIAS moved from Wassenaar, when it was very isolated, everybody was withdrawn from the outside world, and now we are in Amsterdam, and we say, well, we reach out to the people, we have meetings in SPY 25, we do so well. But she told us, you are not curious, you don't, f you are not inviting the world into NIAS. Um, and uh, I actually, I do agree with you, that criticism was really to the point. Um, because even in Amsterdam, we ask our fellows to be at NIAS, to withdraw from the world, to not invite uh, their team. And you changed that. You started to invite your collaborators to come and to come over to the NIAS lunch and to open up the world, uh, NIAS to the world. So perhaps we shouldn't have used yet the term curiosity-driven research, but after Evelyn Cronin, NIAS <laughs> promises to do that and to pursue that. So thanks for that once more. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think, Evelyn, you should pose a little bit for that. <laughs> Evelyn, it was a pleasure having you at NIAS. It was a pleasure having you on the stage this afternoon. And it was also a pleasure to have you three uh, discuss with Evelyn and perhaps help you develop new lines of inquiry. And it was also a pleasure to hear from all of you. And let's continue our drinks. Thank you. Thank you.